And I think that um, you just really have to put that fear aside and you have to figure out why you want to do it. Today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, elements.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Antonio Pantoja. What's up, brother? Oh, man, nothing much. I'm just doing better than I deserve. I'm on Indie Film Hustle right now. This is insane. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I truly, truly appreciate it, man. You reached out to me uh, a while ago, a little while ago, and you showed me your movie, and you told me the story behind it and and uh, and kind of what Indie Film Hustle has done for you in the process of it. So before we get going, I, want, I really want to talk about, first of all, how did you find Indie Film Hustle, and what has it been like doing for you? Like, Because I, I like to know what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, so I can better the situation for Indy, for, for the tribe. So first of all, how did you find us in the first place? You know, I, I mean, it was a desperate search to find anything I could grab a hold of for like information on filmmaking. And then you were putting out content like I have never seen before. I mean, two, three episodes a week. It was insane. And then not only that, but the blogs. And then, dude, I think I bought all of your Udemy courses and <laughs> lipstick and bullets and Anything that you were putting out, I was buying all of it. And the funny thing about you is you're not going to stand behind anything or endorse it unless it really works for your community. Right. And I respected it so much. So I've hung on every word, man, for, I mean, the better part of, I mean, about four years now you've been on? Almost three and a half years, man. So you, yeah. you were there at the beginning? You were starting out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was there very early, man. So I checked in and I listened to all of the podcasts early and a lot of them more than once on flights and commutes and dude, I still, I still replay a lot of them, you know, that are completely it. amazing and changed my life, man. Because I think a lot of people in this situation, like filmmaking community, mm -hmm. they don't have a positive voice. And, right. and a lot of time you speak directly to the tribe, you know, directly at them. And, you know, just like ET, the hip hop preacher, Eric yeah, Thomas, yeah. one of your guests. Yeah. And, uh, and it's funny, man, because you are their only voice, just like you were my only voice. I'm in Kentucky. Yeah. Not a lot of filmmakers out here. There's a right. lot of people doing really great work, but you were my only voice. So like when I went to make really rough decisions and tough decisions, it was your voice in the back of my head that helped me, you know, overcome those. That's so awesome to hear, man. I, pre I appreciate it, man. It's not easy doing what I do. I try to, I, I do it with a lot of love and a lot of great energy and a lot of good vibes because I truly want to help the tribe and help people who listen to whatever I do and, 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 and you know, consume the content that I create. But it's what's really wonderful to hear that and, and that the impact is, you know, is real because a lot of times you just sit here with a mic and, you, you know, you see little numbers fly by and, and occasionally you get, you know, messages and things like that. But to hear it straight, you know, eye to eye is awesome, man. So I'm glad I could I could be of help to you uh, in any way, shape or form, brother. Um, now, let's get into it, man. First of all, how the hell did you get into this business? Oh, man, it's a it's a crazy story. So, uh. So basically, uh, my dad had passed away in 2009, and uh, and my daughter and I had two seconds of video before he passed, and uh, and that's all I had. It was a camera that like I won from like selling stuff at this company I was working for. And two seconds of video for him, and my daughter was always asking me, "Can you tell me stories about your dad and how he came from Peru and all these things?" And and I said, "Baby, I, I think I told you all the stories I got." And I said, "It would be incredible if I could have a video of him telling her stories." or anybody, you know, who, right. uh, their unborn grandchildren. And, and I really wanted to get in the business and do video for people who were terminal or sick so oh. that they could speak to their unborn grandchildren and people who didn't know them. And they would really be able to get a hold of them. So I was on a search for that for a long time and interviewed a bunch of people and tried to get into that, you know, and do that thing because I felt so much fulfillment through it. And I, I started doing weddings and commercials and just anybody who would let me point a camera at them. I just kind of realized that it, video makes you immortal. You live on forever through video and, you know, your story goes on for all eternity. And I thought that was so beautiful. And I'll say this too. Um, I, I said there's not many filmmakers in Kentucky. There's mm -hmm. not many. 
there's great ones here, though. There really is some good ones. So I don't want to like discount their efforts in any way <laughs> because we have some really good ones who I'm so jealous of because they're amazing. But I got you. So and you you kind of got started with photography, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got a camera that did both. It was a Canon T2i a long time ago. And, uh, and it, it, you know, it's, it's it dual purpose. So it does video and photography. So I started doing some photography. I took pictures of my daughter. And I just knew that you live on forever through through print and photos and video. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started doing that. And it, it just uh, it blossomed from there. I did my first short film six months after I had the camera. I did the 48 hour film project. And, uh, and it was a ton of fun, man. And then I just became obsessed with it, you know, and it's easy to like in this industry, it's so easy to become obsessed. Oh, and then some, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be too obsessed. And then some, my friend, without question, right. what I loved about, um, you know, one of the reasons, I, cause I get hit up all the time for people to be on the show, but I really loved that you came from a photography background because your shorts look uh really really good like you can tell that there's a photographer behind it because i know photographers and i know other um you know yeah no photographers who've made that transition into either cinematography or into filmmaking and man their stuff is always tight man it is tight and I, you know i wanted to kind of highlight that in this episode because you know you've learned a craft and then we're able to translate that craft into what you really love to do and i'm sure you love photography but I know yeah. you probably really love filmmaking as well. And you took yeah. time, it took time to get there, right? You had to build those tools up and put those tools in your toolbox, correct? Absolutely. I think that photography is a really good start for anyone who wants to get into filmmaking because you can be as imaginative as you want to be and you only have to focus on one frame, which is the beauty in it. So my work is really different. It's a lot of uh, composites and very fantasy, ethereal kind of images. So mm -hmm. they're all very different, you know? Um, and I try to tell a big story in each photo, and each photo usually does carry a story with it. Um, it's so different that I didn't think anybody would uh, would like it, and it wouldn't resonate with anybody. So I was very surprised that, like, people were giving it a chance, you know? But, um, but yeah, it's it, I think it's an interesting place to start in photography where you can just focus on one picture to tell a story, and then video, almost you can you can tell the story uh, in much different ways, and uh, you have a lot of uh, I guess more uh, leverage to be able to tell the story that you want to. Now, I, I want to ask you a question because this is this is something I've 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 always wondered about people, and I, I love asking this question. What gave you the courage to go down the art the artistic path? You know, especially in a place like I live in L.A., this is very easy to jump into a, an artistic path here because it's everywhere. When yeah. you're living in Louisville, Kentucky, not the mecca yeah. of Hollywood by any stretch of the imagination. So yeah. at what point, what what did you just say to yourself that got you off your butt to actually start learning a new skill and the bravery to kind of just go into the unknown? Because it really was the unknown. Yeah, I think that honestly, man, um, social media is beautiful for that. So like as much as Sometimes I hate technology because I feel like the human brain isn't supposed to go through all these emotions at once where you're scrolling through, you know, Facebook and you're sad, then you're mad and then you're happy all in 10 seconds. Right. It's, you shouldn't do that. But um, <laughs> I think we're not cut out for that, really. But um, but I think it does serve a really great purpose for artists, especially because when you're putting stuff out there and people are engaging with you and and, you know, giving you permission to create more. Mm -hmm. I think that's so helpful, man, because as much doubt as you might have, mm -hmm. people that really that you love and respect might be encouraging you and inspiring you. So I think a lot of it was that, man. And of course, you know, my wife is so close to me and she she, you know, enables me to do these things and helps me, you know, and uh, she's a photographer as well, too. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, man, I think that social media is so great for that because it's it's bad for a lot of things yeah. and, um, and it, really bad. But um, but I think that, you know, you have to you have to be able to groom your friends list and your audience in such a way that. You know, if people are speaking really negatively about you, then why do they feel the need to, to say that publicly? Maybe you can take it offline and be like, yo, man, um, that really hurt my feelings, man. You know, in a private message, uh, I, I worked so hard on this image and I, I, you don't know what it means to me, you know, or this short film or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And, uh, and, you know, usually it's a power thing when people are that negative to you. They really just want to put their thumb over you in front of a big audience, you know, when they get that platform. So... I think if you just address it and communicate, man, you'd be very surprised that you can kind of uh, pull the levers to 
um, to diffuse that negative feedback. So you're gonna get that in the beginning. You know, you're gonna like you always say, man. You make you're gonna make your first film's gonna suck. You know, it's gonna <laughs> no question. And I always found that haters, because um, I've had my share of them in, over over my career without question. It's not about you. It's about them. It's much more about them and what they're dealing with and what they're projecting onto you. Their, their own fears, their own uh, biases, their own judgments. But a lot of it's all fears and judgments of themselves. So when they see someone else going in, it's that whole uh, going up or doing something that they wish they could be doing. It's the whole crab in the bucket vibe yep, that they just the want to try to pull you down. And that's why you just kind of got to roll it off like, you know, like, uh, like, like, like the incomparable Taylor Swift says, just shake it off. <laughs> <laughs> she speaks the truth. But that is true, man. I mean, um, you know, somebody said one time that uh, a lot of people want to see you succeed, but they just don't want to see you doing better than them. You know, and it's so true, man. And when you're doing something outside of your element and, you know, you're doing something positive, there will be negativity. But, you know, you just got to. You will learn more negativity in this in this business once reviews start coming out about your film and stuff like that. But but uh, yeah, you just got to push through the negativity and you got to figure out why you want to do it. So if if you're in love with the reception of it, like oh Antonio, it was such an awesome film, I love it. If I'm in love with that, then that's the wrong way to be. You know, I need to be in love with the work, which I right. am. I'm in love with the work. I'm in love with things that people hate, like going and finding props. And location scouting and things that suck and people quitting on you. I love all that stuff, man. I'm obsessed with it. But I think if you're not in love with that, it's going to be a very difficult, uh, difficult journey. Well, without question, I think that you know if you don't love what you do every day, and, and you ha and you're forced to go do it, which many, many, many people around the world do, uh, it is um, it is very difficult to move forward. <laughs> oh, I agree. But uh, but if you have so and this might be somebody's first episode. So yeah. if you have this as an outlet, like Indie Film Hustle was my film school. Right. If Indie Film Hustle was my film school, like there's a lot of great content out there that exists that you can maybe piecemeal over a long time. But Indie Film Hustle can be your film school. Like this this can get you through a lot of those. Like Alex's episodes deals with haters. He has an episode dedicated to haters. <laughs> like that that changed my life, man. So. I think that um, that this show, the the power of it is that it, it can be somebody's film school. It can guide them through, man. If if they go and listen to every episode, now you're on like two hundred and almost three hundred, almost three, yeah, almost three hundred. Yeah. So uh, so I think that you know if if you and especially like the last few, but if if you go through that, take that journey, and like you said, listen to it in the car. Li don't waste any time. Have a headphone in your ear while you're cooking, cleaning, whatever, um, man. That this could really put them on their path if this is what they really want to do. This show alone. Oh, I, I do appreciate that. There are many, many things out there uh, that could help them, educate them, audiobooks, other things like that as well. But uh, I, 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 I'm I glad that I can provide some sort of value to them on their journey. I, I would look, dude, I wish I had, I wish I had something like this podcast or even a lot of the stuff that we all take for granted when I was coming up. You forget YouTube. Had, there was there was a time that there's no information about filmmaking like you had to go to the library to pick oh, up a yeah. book from the 70s to read yeah. about how scorsese made taxi driver that was the best it had there's so much information out there now there's so yeah. much there's no excuses for not making your own stuff just right. just there's no excuses you know well you put me on you or you put me on you to me which yeah. is amazing but you also put me on um audiobooks because i do audible now and like yeah dude I've listened to so I don't I never I had never read a book so right. like I have literally never read a book except Rebel Without a Crew only book I ever read yeah in great my book whole life. great book but when I got Audible dude I listen to everything now yeah. man oh yeah I, and and that's that's it's huge and I think that he's got links so this is for the listeners he's got links to Audible books that he recommends there's a top ten that he has and dude they're all amazing they will change your life. I, I, I appreciate that. I've become much more audible centric lately where I'm reading about two or three books a week and it, it, it's changing my whole perspective on everything. And it's just educating. You're always educate. You're always learning. You're always kind of growing. And that's where you got to be as a filmmaker, as an artist and as a human being in general. You just got to keep educating yourself, keep exposing yourself to new ideas that uh, you never know what's going to spark the next yeah. big thing in your life. It could be a book. It could be a, a article. It could be a podcast. It could be, you know, a video on YouTube. It could be whatever it is. You always have to expose yourself to as much uh, great stuff as possible. Now let's get into your movie, man, because that's why I wanted to bring you on the show. Okay, one, mu one must fall. Yes. For, first of all, it looks insane. 
It looks beautiful. Um, it looks ridiculous. <laughs> it looks crazy. Um, tell us a little bit about the film. So uh, thank you so much for that, by the way. But uh, but One Must Fall is um, it's about a girl uh, from the 80s. And, and sidebar, I didn't do an 80s film because nostalgia is popular right now. Mm -hmm. um, I had to get rid of cell phones and technology so that I could make a slasher film, you know? Right. So I, I, uh, I didn't want to incorporate that into my film and just be like, oh, you know, the service is dead here. That sucks. We can't call the police now. <laughs> um, I just wanted to get rid of technology completely because I felt that it ruined the slasher film. So... Uh, I made an 80s movie and I got all the 80s props and all that to make it period authentic and everything. But um, but basically it's about a girl in working in the 80s office environment and she's uh, working for this, uh, you know, he's a very chauvinistic boss. He's a jerk and he fires her wrongfully. So she gets a job on a crime scene cleanup crew where they clean up murders and suicides. It's a real job, by the way. Yes, it is. And, I, and basically uh, this, this killer's on the loose in Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm from. And he's, he's, uh, he kills people in warehouses and leaves their bodies. And basically in this situation, he killed 10 people and he's in this 80,000 square foot warehouse and the killer was never apprehended. But guess what? The crime scene cleanup crew still has to come and clean the bodies up if they're discovered, even if the killer's not ended. So I thought, what would happen if they're locked in there, you know, with a killer and he was never caught, but he's somewhere in this massive building. What would, what would happen? Can they survive the night? And uh, so that's kind of what the movie's about. And, um, and yeah, man, it's just uh, it's everything that I've loved since I've been a kid. So I just kind of, you know, molded that into something that I would love to make. Oh, that's awesome, man. Now, how, um, how did you finance the film? Um, I did uh, a couple different things. Um, so I think in order to keep the budget low, I just kind of followed your blueprint. So mm -hmm. you said, and so did Robert Rodriguez in his Rebel Without a Crew book. But you said... Uh, keep it fixated to one location if you can, mm -hmm. few locations as possible, few actors as possible, you know, that kind of thing. And um, use your resources, the things that you have access to. So I had access to this warehouse. So that's kind of where I started. And then I wrote it based on that so that the budget could be tailored to something that's small enough for me, me to be able to do. And just like you, you know, my budget's under 10 million, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but basically, um, I did, uh, I had, I, I had a really, uh, unorthodox way of financing. So I created a business plan and, uh, and you know, I, most people will ask, you know, people who are rich for money. And I think that's the wrong way to do it. So what I did and by accident, I got the money. So I said, I, I, I created my business plan and I sent it to the two people I respect the most. And I said, would you be willing to take a look at my business plan? I respect your business acumen so much. Um, would you be willing to give me advice on it, you know, for my movie? And both of them looked at it. So indirectly, they just had to read it. Sure. And both of them looked at it, and they gave me the money. But I think that wow. if I would have asked them for the money, <laughs> then they would have probably been like, no, man. No, I'm not looking at that business plan. But I was like, yo, do you think you could look at this? And I didn't do that on purpose, of course. There was no malice or anything. Mm -hmm. But I, I just – I really did respect their business acumen. So I sent it over to them, and both of my friends uh, funded the film. But they're they're very close friends, so uh, – you know, what's, what's funny is that that is a great way to get you, you like you again, you did it without knowing, but you kind of snuck it through the door. You, 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 you snuck it by the bouncer and got into the party without <laughs> without actually meaning to do so. But it's yep. a great way. I mean, when you when you ask somebody for something, it's a completely different thing is like when I want money from you. That's you're going to get your guard up. I'm like, I want your opinion. Because I respect you, so now you're you're feeding their you know ego. I know you didn't mean to, but you're feeding their ego a little bit, and you're like, you know what? I need you to be kind. Can you be kind to me for a second? And I just want to because you're so good at what you do. Can you just look this over? And if you've done your job in the business proposal, you might get financing. Yeah, you know? I think that's what it was. You it's know, and, uh, and they've known it. my work previously, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and it, I think that, man, uh, a lot of people will just come right out. Like you always said, just treat it like a date. You don't ask somebody to bed as soon as you meet them, you know. And uh, <laughs> right. you always say that, you know. And, and and you know, it was by mistake almost, but I sent it to two of my buddies. And I think that that's what people should do. I think that they should send it to people they respect anyways and get positive feedback on it. But, yeah, man, so, uh, so I was very lucky. So they were like, this is it. And they financed most of it. 
And then we figured that it would be good to do a like a crowdfunding campaign in sure. addition sure. so that I could just get the word out that it's in existence, that mm-hmm. you know I'm actually doing it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then that will really hold my feet to the fire. So I did that as well. How was your um, well, how was your experience crowdfunding, man? I hated it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I hated it's it. It's second job. It's so horrible. you have to curate these videos like, you know, as often as humanly possible. And I mean, everybody knows who's in video, how long it takes to, to yeah. do a good one. So yeah. you're doing that two, three times a week or more. And, um, you know, it's tough. It's like a second job doing that. And I still got to I've still got to get the T-shirts to the people and the posters and DVDs that I've promised them. And it's taken longer than I had anticipated. So I feel horrible about it. But, you know, that's part of crowdfunding, I think. That yeah, I I can't. I hated it. I hated every minute of it. It's a just grueling, and your like your stomach is all in taut knots. Like, is anyone gonna do anything? It was oh, it was brutal, brutal, yeah, it, brutal. It is. It's scary. It's so nerve wracking to do that, you know. And um, but it works. You know. And if you've got look, if you've got you've got the as they say cojones to do it, um, and and <laughs> and you can hold on to it, man, go for it. Uh, yeah. It is a great way of doing it, but it is uh, it is work. <laughs> people I don't agree. really I realize agree. it. I think people underestimate it when they're like, "Oh, I'm just going to get a bunch of money," because that's not what it is. It, there's work. Uh, there's oh, a lot of work there, and then, pl- and then in post, like once it's done, like once you got the movie done, there's the, now you got to give the stuff that you promised to the people who paid for it. So it's yeah. it's pretty it's pretty brutal. No no question about it. Um, now I want to ask you something. What is the biggest fear you had to overcome uh, to make this film? Because this is your first feature, right? This is my first feature. Yes. Um, I think the the fear of rejection is the reason that people do not proceed in the first place. Mm -hmm. But um, but one of the guests on your show uh, has been an idol of mine for a long time. Lloyd Kaufman. He's been an idol of mine for (laughs) for ages since I was a kid. And uh, and I reached out to Lloyd. Probably I met him three years ago, I want to say. Sure. And then uh, and then he, he called me. And he's he told me uh, he told me exactly what you said. So basically, he said, um, you know, you're treating this like it's a huge dragon that you have to slay, but it's not. This is just your first feature. And I'm like, yeah, it's my first feature. That's that's why it's scary. And he goes, no, 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 it's just your first feature. It's not your last feature. It's just a feature. Yeah. And then this is exactly what you had been telling me. You know, because I went through it with myself with my first film. Yeah. Right. Indirectly watching, listening to your podcast, you had been telling me this exact same thing. And we we had spoken about you a lot as well. But Lloyd was in my movie. So he's like, listen, man, you're going to do that. You're going to do the film. Uh, And I said, I'm going to do the film. And he goes, no, you're going to do it because I'm going to be in it. And and then he's been I really was like, oh, my God, I really have to do this. My hero, Lloyd Kaufman, you know, so. So I was in the film, and <clears throat> Lloyd has been a, a huge wealth of knowledge, as you know. Yeah, um, yeah. He's been through everything in this industry. And um, and then, you know, like, uh, so overcoming that fear of, like, uh, you know, as soon as I get the Alexa, then 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 it's going to be time. Well, you know, I got the Alexa now, but as soon as I get the Zeiss lenses that I want, <laughs> then surely then I'm going to be ready. Dude, you're never going to be ready. You're, you're always never scared, gonna be ready. man. You're always hiding behind the fear, man. It's it's always something. It. It's always something. I, I I speak from the from doing it myself. It's like, well, I need this camera. I need these lenses. I need this location. I need this amount of money, or else I just can't do it. Well, you're yeah. hiding. You're being scared, you know, as opposed yeah. to like grabbing a camera, whatever camera you got around. Like, you know what? I'm gonna go do it, and yeah. I and something's good's gonna come out of it. Something. Yeah. I'm gonna learn something. But- I'm gonna meet somebody. Something's gonna happen. There will always be an excuse. If you make one, they said if you truly want to do something, um, then you'll find a way. But if you truly don't, then you'll find an excuse. And that's the truth, man. You will find an excuse. And I and then I noticed that in myself. But it was through your voice that I was realizing and identifying those issues that I was having. Because, dude, you say that about every other episode, man. Because You're like, was, just get out there and do it. Dude, because it took me, I was 41 when I made This Is Meg, you know? And it was a little short, you know, it was a little film. I just kind of like, you know, threw it together with a friend and and it came out really, I loved it. I thought it was, you know, it's I not it. the greatest movie in the world. It's not the worst movie in the world. It was just something I did. I was like, you know what? I got to prove to myself that I can go do this. I know yeah. theoretically I have the skills, theoretically I have the experience, but I just never done it. So let me just, just kind of you know you know get it out there, clean out the pipes, if you will, uh, yeah. and then uh, after that after that pipe was cleared out, now it's just like all right, now I'm open, let's do this, and That's right. and, and you just keep you keep rocking and rolling after that. But you just gotta, you know, your first film's not gonna be Reservoir Dogs. 
It's not going to be mariachi. It's not going to be slacker. It's not going to be boys in the hood. It's not going to be paranormal activity. It's just not, you know, yeah. there might be that one person who does it, but generally it's not. So just get that out of your head and then just yeah. do what you want to do. And I think your audience, <clears throat> I think they have seen this as Meg, the majority of your audience, but if you haven't, Go check it out like ASAP because I think that a lot of the people out there preaching and teaching and stuff like that, they haven't made a feature. They haven't even made a feature. Like most of the people that I was following had not made a feature film. You know, they right. they were on the same level as me. They were both they were all scared to to commit to it. <laughs> right. You know, and then then you come a, a, along and you're like, you know what? I'm going to take you on my journey and I'm going to show you every step of the process and how I fail and how I succeed with this film. And I thought that was amazing. And, and I hadn't seen that through that lens just yet. And it inspired me. I did a whole behind the scenes for my movie as well mm -hmm. that I plan to eventually like workshop and free classes for and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I do free classes here locally yeah. with like yeah. photography. And man, I didn't know if one person will show up or five people will show up, but I show my whole process, lighting, shooting, editing right there, you know, That's crazy awesome. composites and stuff. And man, 300 people show up to it, man. So you inspired that, man. So I'm just, oh, I'm just, man. For, 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 and before we continue, I did not pay you to say all these things. So let's <laughs> make sure everybody knows this. He is not a ringer. Uh, I just, I do not truly, I honestly I appreciate all the accolades and, and uh, I'm, I'm really, really grateful and, and, and humbled by everything. But just so everybody knows, <laughs> I had never met Anthony before this day. Uh, we've spoken a couple times on email. This is the first time we're actually talking. Uh, so just put that out there. <laughs> yeah, it's true. There's no endorsement. Uh, I just, I, I love the podcast, man. I'm a huge fan. So, um, That's awesome, so man. for me, this, this is huge for me. Cause I'm a, so I'm a guy who has an eighth grade education. All I right. used to be homeless, you know, so like, uh, going, being on this show to me is, uh, is maybe the most important thing that I've done right now to date. Now, let me ask you a question though. So I want to, I want to touch on something if it's okay with you. When you just yeah. said that, you know, you're homeless. How did you, cause that means a lot. I mean, that, that means a lot to me is like one of my, my favorite episodes is about a homeless girl who, who, who was an artist and couldn't break out. And, and I, and I was just in, in, in inspired episode 88 where I just curse at everybody for an hour and tell people <laughs> I was so angry. So I want to, I want you to, can you, do you mind talking a little yeah. bit about that process and how you got yeah. out of it? Because a lot of times, and, and, and the reason why I want to ask this and I'm not trying to be intrusive or anything, but I, I really think it could be an inspirational story to people listening to this right now because there's so many people listening right now to this that are making excuses or like sitting in their house, you know, that's, you know, half a million dollars and or, you know, or, or have the support of their parents and have, you know, all the money in the world, but they're scared to do this or do that or, or whatever your situation is, you know, but homeless is a whole other level of shit you got to go through to get out. Yeah. So there's, I, so tell me a little bit about that, man. So I came from a bit of a broken home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My dad was an immigrant. He was a laborer. He worked all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anybody has had their, their house worked on by, uh, by like an immigrant, uh, Spanish speaking immigrant, they know that they work forever, you know? And that's they, oh yeah. Dad. Yeah. So that was my dad. So he was a painter. Uh, he left way before I got up for school when it was dark and he came home way after I got, you know, when it was dark again, he never saw a light ever. So basically, um, he was always gone. I came from a very broken home. I was sort of raised by the television. And, uh, and then yeah. my mother had put me out, I think when I was about, I think I was 15, I might've been 14. I was on, I was 15 and I had a car. Luckily I was driving illegally, but I lived in my car. <clears throat> there was one moment where I was, you know, in my car and stuff and it rained on me and stuff like that. And I had to like figure out a way to stop the water from coming in. There was another time where there was kids that were on their way to a party walking behind my car, you know, and I'm trying to go to sleep and I'm thinking, will I eat tomorrow? And these guys are walking behind me and they're headed to a party and they're dressed beautifully and stuff like that. And I was thinking, God bless, how different are our lives? But, but anyways, I just always worked. So, um, so that was the one thing. I just um, I got a chance. So when I was a little bit older than that, uh, I couch surfed forever on friends' couches and stuff like that. I didn't go to school. And then, um, and then I got a chance. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Lee Kuyper and Josh Emhoff, friends of mine, they let me work at this place. Uh, it was like a, to be an account executive in a Fortune 50, Fortune 500 company. So I borrowed clothes to do the interview, and I walked in this building, and, and I could see my reflection in the building. And I'm like, God, this building is so beautiful. And I looked at the reflection. I said, that's the first time I've ever dressed nice in my whole life. I said, I'll treat, clean the trash out of this place. I said, if they give me the chance, 
I'll work harder than every person in here. And I did, and I kept climbing the ladder. And then I got to like a management position. I had my own team. And, and then eventually, I, they hired more people based on our performance. Right. And it was beautiful. So I thought that was amazing. And I just kept on doing that because I realized that the ripple effect of your positive actions can affect somebody else so greatly, more than you will ever know. Like you, you're doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't know if, it, now you know people listen. But yeah. when you first started, <laughs> yeah. you didn't know if anybody's gonna listen. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. And now back to the show. But right. you still did it. And then, and then you started to realize that, oh my God, this is really affecting people. Right. Kind of the same deal. So, so that's where I had started. And um, I was in a bad situation, man. I just, uh, you know, I was hanging around people I probably shouldn't be hanging around for years. Yeah. I'm covered in tattoos. Look at me. But, <laughs> but, uh, but man, eventually I was able to, to get out of that situation uh, for somebody positive who took me under their wing, who I owe all of the respect in the world to. And, um, and that guy who hired me and put me on and kept promoting me, mm -hmm. he ended up in my film, man. That's yep. amazing story. That's such an amazing story, man. And, and, and literally, I, I, like I always say, you know, hustle outweighs everything. You know, it outweighs I, education. It outweighs talent. It outweighs yep. everything, man. You just gotta hustle and hustle and learn as you grow and just keep you just keep showing up every day and growing every day. You just don't know what's gonna happen. And look at this. You came from living in your car and then the guy that gives you a leg up or just opens the door. Didn't he didn't, you know, just hand you anything. He just opened an opportunity for you to bust your ass. Yep. And then from there you were able to build your life up to the point where then at the end not at the end, but at this point in your journey, he finances your movie, man. Yeah. You know, he always told me, man, he's like, uh, you got to send the elevator back down. He always instilled that in me. And then he also said that um, the only time you should look down on somebody is when you're helping them up. And he, Amen, I, you know, I've man. heard this guy all the time. It's Lee Kuyper. He's, he's amazing, this guy, you know? And, um, but I've had so many opportunities, you know, because of him or because of, right. honestly, man, it was always because of either I worked really hard mm -hmm. and someone recognized it or I was nice to someone. And that's how I've gotten every opportunity in my whole life. And uh, by the way, I don't want to keep saying that without mentioning my friend Dorian Washington, who also financed the movie. He was amazing. Who's a genius too? So I got to mention. <laughs> no, of course, of course. No, that's that's really an amazing story. And I hope everyone listening out there understands that wherever you are in your life, you can you can better yourself. You can get out of it. You're in a bad situation. Go. That's why I wrote my book. I really wanted to get people to to just understand that it's, it's your choice. It's always a choice. To show up positive and, or to show up at all. And yeah, if you do, right. and if you do, things will happen for you. That I can promise you. Now, um, when you started the movie and, and you know, you went through post, when did you start working on your marketing plan? Oh, instantly. <laughs> so I had I had anticipated this for the better part of, you know, since I started. So I've almost been doing this 10 years now. Oh. My dad's almost been past 10 years, which is insane. Right. But uh, I have him tattooed here. So uh, podcast guys won't be able to see it, but I've got him tattooed all over That's my awesome. heart. But, uh, but basically, um, I started instantly. So as soon as I knew that I wanted to do this and I wanted to make a film, um, I did what you said to do. You said to, the riches are in the niches. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I knew that I had to, you know, I went in the horror direction because I knew I didn't have to have a star in order for somebody to give my film a chance. Mm -hmm. So that was very important to me. So, um, so I started marketing the film in Facebook groups. Not even just marketing the film. I started marketing myself and providing value to those groups. <sighs> By saying things like uh, just posting memes and funny stuff and getting questions started where uh, polls and where people start discussions and stuff like that. Just getting my name out there in a situation where people recognize me when I post. That way, because I knew I was setting it up for success years prior. So now when I post, I get a lot of engagement. So sometimes I'll get a thousand comments or a thousand likes, uh, sometimes more. But, um, but it's because I had set that up so far in advance. The other part of it. It's just sweat equity, man. Just reaching out to magazines and websites. And 
I don't have a PR person. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have any of that stuff. I, I reached out to every. Uh, there's a guy named Russell Jeffrey Banks who did a film called Who's Watching Oliver? Mm-hmm. And this guy is a huge wealth of knowledge. He, the film was blowing up, awards everywhere, major success. <clears throat> Got picked up by, I want to say, Raven Banner. Maybe it was somebody bigger. But, mm-hmm. um, oh, Gravitas picked him up. Mm-hmm. But basically, he was just saying, dude, you got to get that trailer out there. You know, you only got 60,000 views on the trailer. You got to get that number up, man. And he's like, you need to reach out to the people who uh, host trailers on, on, on YouTube channels. And here's a few of them that I used. And, dude, he was a huge help too, man. When you're in this industry, man, it's so funny. Like, you're trying to, like, go through the pipe. And at the beginning, the base of this pipe, you're trying to swim through the pipe, right, and get to the other side. Mm-hmm. But the base... There's all these people trying to deflect you from swimming through. Man, <laughs> you get through that pipe and you finished your movie. There's all these like welcoming arms who are like, "Get up in here, man! You're part of the club now. Give me a hug, you know." And uh, and that's what it was, man. So I think that because a lot of people say and they don't do, man. They never execute. They mm-hmm. they talk it, but they never do it. So so once you pass it, and you get through there, man. They give you your members only jacket. And uh, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and, you know, you actually did what uh, I've been talking about for a long time is, you know, it's a, not a it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And you were starting to lay those seeds down early on. So when you build that audience up um, or people at least are aware of you, the second you start posting stuff that you want to to promote or get help with, they're on it because you've given them that value. You've provided that to them. It's pretty awesome to see it in, in action. Man, thank you. I learned it from you, man. I just followed your blueprint, man. It's out there, <laughs> you know. Again, it's again, out there for people. I, again, I didn't pay him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what is you know? Since this is your first uh, first feature, and I know you've been you've been directing other shorts and things like that. But what is the craziest thing that happened to you on set? The craziest thing, man, is um, it, it actually turned out to be a positive because I think that there are film gods that really exist. Oh yeah, no question, no question, no question. No Something question. is out there, just like uh, Steven Spielberg's Jaws, man. The shark didn't work, and that was the best thing that ever happened to him. But so basically, <clears throat> what happened was about it was less than a week before the the movie was supposed to start principal photography, and I had paid a special effects artist up front to be working on body parts and stuff like that that are instrumental for my film i knew that that was going to be the superstar practical effects Mm -hmm. it's got to be a true 80s movie everyone who like loves 80s cinema hates vfx right Mm -hmm. for blood gore and stuff like that so i had to be very careful with it right so the guy i hit him up and i'm like yo um can i get some progress pictures and he's like uh you're putting me on a really bad situation here you know it's like a week before the shoot i was trying to be very (laughs) careful because i really needed them so i'd asked him for progress pictures all the way leading up to about a week before the shoot and he's like and i said dude are you are you quitting on me and he did he quit on me dude and i cried man i paced around my house for six hours like what am i gonna do man you know and i don't know what i'm gonna do and uh a friend of a friend just like i said you're nice to somebody and you will get opportunities But every opportunity I've ever had was because I was kind to someone. But anyways, so uh, a friend of mine, Lindsay Mormon, had uh, Vincent Guastini call me, who is a legend in the special effects community. So he did like Jared Leto's arm and Helen Bernstein's neck for uh, Requiem for a Dream and um, Dogma. He did the the angel wings and dog. And he's done so much iconic work. Stephen King's Thinner, Child's Play, just tons of stuff. And he called me. He's like, I'm going to come and help you. What's that budget? And I said, dude, take everything, you know, just take <laughs> take it all. And, uh, and it was, he just really hooked me up, man. And he's just a hell of a guy. And he came out here and he did it. And he's so above what I'm doing, man. He's worked on films that have won, I mean, real, like Oscars and stuff. And he still came out and helped me, man, which is uh, which was so beautiful. He's like, yeah, man, I've got... I've got body parts from, you know, the movie VHS that I did, and I've got heads from Cabin Fever, and you know, I'll bring them to you, man. And and he did, man, and he came through and killed it. And uh, and I think that's that's part of it, man. And but watching the machine work, man, on the on the opposite end of that spectrum, that was the toughest part. But watching the machine work was so beautiful, man. It's it's everything, man. When you put pen to paper, and you see that those characters come to life, man, and uh, from your pen to their mouth. That's the most beautiful thing you're ever going to experience in your life, man, for real. So, uh, but it was, it was beautiful. I loved it. It was, uh, that's awesome, man. That's a great story. Yeah. There are film gods. There's no question yeah. they're film gods. There's, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, they, sometimes there's, there's also uh, film demons, but generally speaking, <laughs> um, and gremlins. Ooh, there's lots of gremlins, a lot of film gremlins. Like, yeah. why is the camera not working? 
And we're, we're, oh, burn, yeah. we're burning through the, oh, the, the sunset, set, sun setting in 10 minutes. We got to go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, what's funny, man, is I sold my car to buy uh, the Red Epic. And, oh, uh, nice. and it was a, a camera that I had lusted over for years, yeah, for years, you know. And uh, and then your film came out like right after I bought it, and, I, and it was beautiful, you know, it was beautiful. And I'm like, oh no, oh god, no, why did I buy this, you know? Because you shot on the Black Magic uh, the 2.5K, yeah, the thousand dollar camera, yeah. And dude, it was gorgeous. And right after you, this is Meg came out. I had just got the Red Epic, and like I just like I just wanted to collapse. I was like, oh god, what have I done? Look, I love Red. I think Reds are great. They make great great, great cameras, but I've. I've kind of fallen in love with the Black Magics because they're just the best bang for the buck, for, in yeah, my in my opinion, in my humble opinion. But at the yeah. end of the day, man, it's whatever you got. It's whatever it's you true. got. You got a Red Epic, man. That's not a bad camera at all. Just shoot with it. Make the it story look. is king. That's all. Story, that matters. story is always king, man. No question. Now I want to ask you, what is the distribution strategy for the film? So right now we've gotten uh, a bunch of offers already, um, which is good. It's good, but it's um, right now there's been no minimum guarantee. And and mind you, I have learned all of my distribution strategy and information through this show. So listen to this, guys. This is very important. Yep. So there is a minimum guarantee that you can get um, up front. And what that means is um, that they're going to give you money up front before you start seeing uh, incremental funds come in from hard copy or VOD sales, right? So I haven't gotten any MG, no minimum guarantee offers just yet, right? But I've heard stories on this podcast and many others where filmmakers wind up owing the distribution company maybe $100,000 because they'll say there's no marketing cap in their, in their, uh, in their contract. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll be like, hey, uh, we went to Romania to market your film, and here's all the receipts. There's $60,000 in receipts. Sure. What, what they don't tell you is that – they had 100 films in their catalog, and they charged all of those 100 films that same $60,000, and they got the receipts to prove it. You know, it's, it's all from the same – so you got to be very careful. you got to go with somebody you trust. But right now I'm getting a bunch of offers because I'm just starting the festival circuit. Mm -hmm. So I've done two festivals now, but I'm doing my world premiere in front of a live audience dates uh, in Cincinnati, March 15th through the 17th. Not a plug. I just want to tell you guys that in that the two festivals, I won 17 laurels. So now there's going to get more interest. So as I go through the festival circuit and, you know, hopefully I'll get accepted, fully prepared for, uh, you know, not getting in because a lot of people don't get into a lot of the festivals, um, especially I know that it's, I'm going to be disappointed. But uh, but anyways, um, I think that as I go through that process, the offers will change once they see that there's an audience and that I have been doing the right thing beforehand and pre-production and marketing and stuff like that. So um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's my marketing strategy as of right now. Not just sit back and wait. Mm -hmm. I'm going to proactively reach out to a few and see what they think. But probably as I get further in the festival circuit and as I start to garner a little bit more attention, get a few more awards, uh, not that I think that my film can beat anybody. Because I know I've seen some stuff out there. I'm like, oh, God, I hope I don't have to go up against that film. So, <laughs> <laughs> art is so, art, man. Art is art. You can't compete. Art can't compete with art. That's just the way it is. It's, you know, the film gods shine on you in that day or not, man. It's all good. Yeah, it's not some sometimes it's not for everybody. You got to realize that your film is not for everybody. You right. got to enter genre festivals if it's a horror film. You know, just enter stuff that's catered to your audience already or else uh, or else you know, you're going to find people that don't like it more often, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's 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 no question about that. And 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 everyone listening, man, look, f film festivals, I've been rejected. I've been in 5, 600 film festivals over the years, but I've been rejected from all of them, all the big boys. You know, Me too. And uh, I, I, I literally just made a whole episode on why I didn't get into Sundance, and you know, and how yeah. pissed off I was about it because I made a movie about Sundance. But yeah. um, you know, well, if I saw I, some statistics. That I think you may have posted this statistics, but like back in 1994, like when they had, I think I don't know if Reservoir Dogs was submitted back in '94 and um and El Mariachi, but there was only like 300 films submitted to Sundance. <laughs> and now I got the letter, like my 14, rejection letter from Sundance. Yeah. And there was fourteen thousand one hundred. It was 14,100, so 100 of them got in, and 14,000 of us are all outside crying. And you uh, got to think, man, like half of those already have like a big name attached, you yeah. know, like. Oh, yeah, studio like, stuff, because they're not, it, Sundance is not as indie as it used to be, without question. They just, yeah. they got, look, they got to fill seats, I guess, and they got to do their own marketing plan, you know. I like South By, you know, even though I was rejected from South By, too, but there's a lot of festivals, you know, there's only, there's only really a handful that really mean anything on a distribution standpoint unless you get a whole lot of laurels like you're doing and again it's the genre is different 
Genre is a whole other, you know, you can show up with no laurels on a genre film and it's going to get attention if it's done, yeah. if it's done well. That's um, right. Now, so what's next for you, man? So I'm working on a bunch of films right now, sadly. Like I'm going like right into it, you know. But uh, friends of mine, they did a movie called Turbo Kid. You had Shaquille of course. on, I think. Yeah, Shaquille, and, yeah. Um, and so basically uh, they did this film back in like – it's like four years ago, maybe five years ago. It won – I think it won at Sundance, but it won everywhere. It was killing it, man. Yeah, Turbo Kid's and, awesome. uh, and they said the number one piece of advice to you is make sure you have your second thing ready because people are always going to ask you what's next. So I started working on stuff before One Must Fall. One Must Fall is not even completely finished just yet. Um, we should probably be, be wrapping everything like within the next two weeks. But um, but yeah, I mean, you have to be working on your next thing right now because everybody's going to want something else. And if your film does do really well, then they're going to want to see what project you have cooking. So I'm working on so many, man. And some of them take, um, I won't say they take political statements or political posture, but um, but I think that they definitely have a voice uh, still in the horror genre because I feel so comfortable, you know, in sure. that in my element there. I have the horror films tattooed all over my whole body. Yeah. But uh, but I, I love it so much, you know, and um, and I think that it will still be in the horror genre. So I'm definitely going to do another horror film. But I think with the next one, I might cut the comedy because uh, I have a little bit of comedy in One Must Fall, and I think I'm going to make something a lot more serious. And uh, you know, I don't want to groom my audience to expect what I'm going to do every single time, you know, and. And I, I want them to, you know, not have a, a general expectation, and, and I want to set the bar higher each time too. Yeah, do it like the Coen Brothers did, man. They set it up right away, like right after Blood Simple. Let's do Raising Arizona. Let's throw them way out, way out. <laughs> and now <laughs> they do right. whatever they want, and now they do whatever the heck they want, whenever the heck they want. Um, that is so true. We could only we could only be so blessed to have a career like the Coen Brothers. You know what's so cool about your show, man, is that you're such a fan, and like especially in the early episodes, like because uh, you were asking questions because you were setting up your feature, yeah. and then uh, and then now, like, dude, you've done it all. But but you you're such a fan of like some of the people who come on this show. It's so cool for me, like as an audience <laughs> member, to like listen to you had. Um, just recently, you had God. What what is his name? Oh my God, I can't believe it's it's escaping me. You, uh, he he just shot he shot a film. He was the first guy to do a digital film right before Star Wars. Oh, uh, Mark Polish. Mark Polish was on, and like you had, I think you had Michael Polish. Yeah, on I had as Michael well. Michael a while ago. Yeah. Yeah, and it was so cool to watch you, like, because you're a fan of them too, and to yeah. watch you do that was so awesome, man. No, it's oh, of course, man. I mean, when I had like Jim Rules from Fight Club on, I geeked out with him for like. You know, I, I always I, when I talk to Jim, I always like, man, thank you for putting up for those first thirty minutes when I just talked to you, saying, so how was David Fincher? How was yeah. it to work with David Fincher? What does David have for breakfast? Like, I mean, I was just the <laughs> biggest fanboy ever. Uh, when, when, but yeah, man, I'm look, I'm, I'm look, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy in Los Angeles just trying to make it like everybody else, man. And and anytime I, I, I pinch myself sometimes with the people I get to get on the show. Um, it really is. And like yourself, you're an inspiration, uh, not only to me, but hopefully to everybody else listening. That you can break through your own fears. You can pull yourself out of wherever you are in life. And and follow that dream, man. That's uh, that's one of the reasons why I want to have you on the on the show, man. So, thank you. Now I'm going to ask you those questions I ask all my guests. So you should probably know them. Um, I know, and I wrote down my answers already. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? I would say just do it. Like you have to, and I mean, you know, it's sad because it's kind of cliche, and I hear a lot of people on this show say it, but you just literally have to do it. There was a guy on this show who made a film in 24 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hours. You cannot. I mean, dude, there. He had no excuses. He just did it. He, it's like I got, I got a day to do it. I'm gonna do it in a day. And he did, man. I shot my film in ten days. Um, you know, the budget was low compared to a lot of other films. You know, under ten and million. Under ten million. It was under ten million dollar budget. Yeah. And I think that um, you just really have to put that fear aside, and you have to figure out why you want to do it. So if it's for the reception, if it's for the laurels. It, that might, if you know, then then make a film to do that. You know, may, maybe make a film to do that where people, are, you know, they they love you for. Or if it's because you just love doing it, like you love the work. Alex loves the work. He does it because he loves the work. He's in love with that. And you know, Conor McGregor said, uh, "I'm not talented. I'm obsessed. Talent mm -hmm. does not exist. I'm just obsessed." And I think that's so true. There's so many truths to that statement. But I think that if you're not talented, if you don't feel that you're talented, but you're obsessed, then you're already beaten most people. You're already out hustling most people anyways. Hey, Amen. Just do it. Let's do it today. Now, can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? 
I can. I had three of them. Okay, and go for it. Of course, it. it's Rebel Without a Crew by Robert Rodriguez. And I was almost on his show, by the way. So uh, I was. Oh, you almost made it onto the Rebel Without a Crew yeah. show? Yeah. Okay, that's... So I got the top seven email. I did about 30 freaking interviews. I did a oh. psychiatric evaluation and the whole thing. <laughs> and I was going to do One Must Fall on that show. And they sent me the top seven email and I got the contract. And I already had like five things booked where I signed contracts for in Kentucky. So I said, I will come back to Kentucky. And they're like, no, dude, you have to find somebody else to shoot that stuff. You can't leave the show. You can't leave the house. You can't even make any, like, you can't even listen to music here. And, all. Yeah, yeah. and I'm like, dude. So I'm like, I heard him already obligated, you know. And and I talked to the producer. He's amazing. And yeah, I made yeah. a really good friend, a couple good friends on the show. Alex was on here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. Josh Stifter's a really good friend. But um, but I didn't end up going on the show. So I uh, I got to watch the show, like, without me on it, man. It was I was depressed for, like, 10 months. But, um. But I made some really good friends on the show because of it, and uh, and they're great guys, and the show was amazing. So check that out if you guys haven't seen it. But the book, definitely check out the book, Rebel Without a Crew. It will change your life. Uh, make Your Own Damn Movie by Lloyd Kaufman. Yep. Uh, Lloyd is a legend. He uh, he was the person who found Samuel L. Jackson. He gave the start to Trey Parker and Matt Stone, Oliver Stone, Kevin Costner, James Gunn. I mean, check yeah. that book out immediately. It's so good. Uh, lastly... Um, there's, there's another one, but, um, but I go pre-order, uh, <laughs> uh, go pre-order. There's a, there's one I need you to pre-order right now and it's called, um, shooting the mob. Oh, shoot- shooting for the mob. Stop it. Shooting for the mob. I did shooting not tell him to do that guys. guys. <laughs> I did not. You're, I mean, <laughs> seriously, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm blushing. Uh, seriously. I'm blushing <laughs> at this point in the game. I no, you. but, uh, but no, I appreciate but, that. Man. The, the, my real last one, cause the shooting for the mob is not out yet. So I'm going to pre-order it today. But, um, cause I, I get, I'm like, I got all Alex's stuff, but, um, uh, but the, the last <laughs> one was the book of revelation. And uh, when I was yeah. little, I wanted to be a priest. Yeah. And uh, for you know, for many years, just because, like I, I told you, I came from a broken home, and I won't divulge the details. I'll spare you those. But um, but I wanted to be a priest because of it. And uh, and then I asked God into the Book of Revelation. It started really scaring me. And I think this is kind of when I first started discovering horror and put, putting it into my nature. And uh, and I asked my mother to take down all the pictures of the Virgin Mary in in the house. And she goes, "Are you are you sick? Like, what is wrong with you?" And I said. You don't take it for what it is. It's a uh, it's a woman who's like she's holding a uh, you know her her, her her fingers on fire and there's a bleeding heart, and and it scared me so bad that like it changed the way that I looked at revi- uh, religion entirely. Sure. And uh, and by the time I was nine, I didn't want to be a priest anymore because I was so scared of it. So um, Book of Revelation, uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but it that changed my life and that was it's, the original question. <laughs> that would uh, that that book is um it it it, it will it will mess you up. It will definitely mess you up, depending on where you are in life. It can, uh, it could definitely do that. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, I think I, I wrote my answer down here. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, let me see. Uh, I wrote it down, but um, but I think the the lesson that took me the longest was, uh, and somebody just said it recently um, on this show, but it was it was patience, and and I think that yeah. honestly, man. Um, we do want things very quickly, and I'm I'm almost 10 years into this industry now, and um, I've worked a lot of day jobs, and I lost a lot of sleep in order to make this dream work. And you're gonna have to make sacrifice um, in, in some part of your day. And Alex uh, posted an episode yesterday about it, and I don't know when this will air, but um, but it was on the 28th. If you guys want to check it out, and basically he's just he's more or less telling you not to waste any time, and and I think that that's very important, you know, because. Um, it's going to take you a long time to get where you want to go. I mean, you could pick up a camera and shoot a movie right now. now will it be good? Probably not. It's, you're going to have to have some sort of patience so that you can learn you know, the things that you need to learn and get with the people that you need to get with and, uh, and network and, and market yourself and stuff like that so that you're in a position to set yourself up for success. But I think patience was uh, ultimately the, the thing that took me the longest. And that was my dad's note um, before he passed away. He wrote me something and uh he said i'm not very good at english and he, he said uh patience and you will make it oh that's so powerful man that's awesome great answer sir great answer and what are the three of your favorite films of all time uh, um three of my favorite films of all time i did write down some but um but i swear if you ask me like five minutes from now sure it'll be different yeah, but I'll, I'll give you my three um 
let the right one in. Uh, it's uh, it's an absolutely beautiful movie. Yes. Um, it's a foreign film, so if you don't mind reading subtitles, there's a lot of amazing foreign films out there. And let the right one in is a really beautiful take on vampire flicks. Um, I would highly recommend it. It will blow you away. You're going to be thinking about it for months. Um, definitely check that one out. Uh, the Exorcist. Um, <laughs> I saw that when I was very young, way too young. My cousin Tracy showed it to me. And and basically, I ruined my parents' sex life because of it, because uh, I was so scared by this movie that I slept in their bed right between them for, uh, until I was 12. And that's why my brother Vinny is eight years younger than me, because I ruined their sex life, because I slept in their bed. They couldn't have sex. So The Exorcist, for sure. And then uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, is a, it's a yeah, masterpiece and yeah, um, no. I'm Hispanic I don't speak Spanish but I'm Hispanic but um and and sometimes like I would have preferred a lot of movies to be in English but this movie is so beautiful in yeah. Spanish that it you would be sad if they lost that part yeah. of it but but Pan's Labyrinth is it's a visual masterpiece and I, I think Guillermo del Toro ended up having to fund that himself yes um, because no one would give him funding for it and it took him like nine years to make it. And, uh, and he wanted to make the movie that he wanted to make because the studios kept uh, making him make the, the wrong kind of movie, not his vision. So so he did it himself, and um, and that's one of the only ones that you'll see where they just let him – he did whatever he wanted. Well, Shape of Water wasn't he, – he pretty much did whatever he wanted on Shape of Water yes. too. There's no question. Well, Gadmo's now – Gadmo's got to the point where he could do whatever he wants to do now yes. at this point in his yes. career. Um, and I had the pleasure of, of, of meeting Gadmo a couple times and – he is everything you think he is. Guillermo is an no amazing human being and so supportive of filmmakers. And uh, he's a genius. He's, he, you know, he is literally a genius, uh, you know, creative genius, an artistic genius. He's on a different playing field than the rest of us. There's no question about it. Are you excited for uh, scary stories to tell in the dark? Of course I am. I'm, anything Guillermo, <laughs> Guillermo could read the yellow pages with a one light bulb on him, and I'd be yeah. like, "Yes, Guillermo, what would you like us to watch now?" Like I love anything Guillermo does. It's yes. um, absolutely amazing. Me too. Now, and where can uh, where can people find you, your work, your film, all that kind of good stuff? I think you guys uh, don't even worry about me. Go look at Indie Film Hustle. Oh, stop it. Stop is it. coming out. Stop it. Stop it. TV is coming out. <laughs> you need to go there. Oh, my God, man. Learn everything. This baby. is crazy. <laughs> you're, you're killing no, me. You're killing me. So no, so ask, answer the question, sir. Don't make me have to cut this out. Where can people find you and where can people find your movie? So I'm on Facebook, uh, Antonio Pantoja. If you're local to me, um, I would love to meet you. I would love to help you in any possible way I can because I, I love this stuff and I live for it. So I'm in Kentucky. But, uh, but if you're anywhere around the surrounding area, Antonio Pantoja, Alex will probably put it in the show notes. I will. So you'll be able to spell that last name, but it's spelled like a jalapeno. The, the J is soft, okay? So Antonio Pantoja. And then my movie's called One Must Fall. And you can search that um, on Facebook or wherever, and, uh, and you'll find it. And then um, definitely watch the trailer. Give the trailer a shot and see if it's your kind of movie. It's not for everybody, but um, Bloody Disgusting is said it might be one of the most gruesome movies of the year. So uh, so maybe it might be <laughs> up your alley. Maybe it, will not. Be, it will be Check on the out. show notes with no question, brother. Antonio, it has been amazing having you on the show. Uh, I have blushed more in this episode than I think I've ever, ever did. So thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, I really do. I do truly mean it. And thank you share, for sharing uh, your honest story with the tribe. And hopefully it inspires uh, other filmmakers to, uh, to ma stop making excuses and get out of, whatever they're in and get going and get going to doing uh and onto that path to get to their dream man so thank you so much again brother i appreciate I just got that one more thing to say yeah man go those. for it um keep that hustle going keep that dream alive <laughs> i'll talk to you soon <laughs> <laughs> thank you brother i appreciate it man hey.